The Greek God of Fertility and Wine In the Middle Ages, Drama in Europe Introduction to Drama Drama is a literary form involving parts written for actors to perform. It is a Greek word which means action. The origin of Western theatre is supposed to be found in ancient Greece. Drama probably developed in ancient Greece from the festivals, honouring Dionysius, the Greek God of Fertility and Wine. In the Middle Ages, drama in Europe dealt with religious characterizations. The plays were mainly biblical, thus had substantial relevance to Christian elements. Although the Christian church did much to suppress the performance of plays, it is actually in the church that medieval drama began. Mystery plays, the most famous of which is the Second Shepherd's Play depicted biblical episodes from the creation to Judgment Day. Another important type that developed from church liturgy was the miracle play, based on the lives of saints rather than on Bible. The miracle play reached its peak in France and the mystery play in England. However, both types gradually became secularized. The Second Shepherd's Play, despite its religious seriousness, is most notable for its elements of realism and farce, while the miracle plays in France often emphasize comedy and adventure. A third type of religious drama is the morality play. The morality plays, which were mainly religious allegories, appeared early in the 15th century, the most famous being Everyman. Drama has always been a target of the government and society. The reason why drama was criticized in Middle Ages was probably because actors were considered to be persons who were taking on other people's personalities, and were therefore thought either to be insane or possibly possessed by evil spirits. A second reason why drama was so often criticized might have been because theater was considered immoral, blasphemous or subversive. We must note that theatrical performances were sometimes used as criticism of the government, able to awaken people. A third reason might have been religious since many of the medieval dramas were based on Christian church. Many of the plays were biblical and were applicable to the church. Drama in England reached its peak during Queen Elizabeth's reign. Elizabethan drama has been called a great national utterance because in it spoke the spirit of England. Despite all its imitations and borrowings from alien sources and there has never been an age which so immediately responded to an artistic appeal, Skelling 13. We should notice the fact that N. 
O plays closely resembling those of the great Elizabethans appeared before the last quarter of the 16th century. Before the tragedies of K.Y.D. and Marlowe and the comedies of Lily and Green the public theatres were being built in 1576, and the first powerful plays appeared about 1587, Wells IV. Queen Elizabeth died in 1603. In 1642 the English Civil War broke out between the Parliamentarians, Puritans, and the Royalists in England and theatres were closed to prevent public disorder. In 1644 the Globe Theatre was demolished by the Puritans. From 1642 onward for 18 years, the theatres of England remained closed. They probably illegally performed plays but those performances were given in secrecy. Neither actors nor spectators were safe during those days of the Puritan rule. The dramatists were not allowed to be inspired during this time. The Puritans led by Oliver Cromwell opposed theatrical performances. Puritanism declared, theater, an ungodly and frivolous thing and decreed that it should be no more, Skelling 274. In 1649, the M. Dotter English Literature Part I study material drama prepared by Atayur Raman J. Duno 3335499063 English Civil War resulted in the execution of King Charles I and the establishment of a Commonwealth under Oliver Cromwell. Finally in 1660 the Stuart dynasty was restored to the throne of England and the theatres were reopened. Charles's death marked the beginning of the 11-year interregnum in which Oliver Cromwell ruled as Lord Protector. After Cromwell's death, England turned to Charles's son and acknowledged him as Charles II. The exhumed heads of Cromwell, his son-in-law, and the High Court's president were placed on public display atop Westminster Hall. The anniversary of Charles's execution became a date of commemoration on the liturgical calendar of the Anglican Church. Sirico 51, Charles II, the King, had been in France and he naturally brought with him some French fashions. That French influence was felt particularly in the theatre since Charles returned from his exile with a very definite love of the drama and of literature in general. Nicol 8. The drama of the Restoration, Thorndike states, was separated from the earlier periods by 16 years of closed theatres and a virtual cessation of all dramatic composition. The Restoration brought not only a revival but also a revolution, new fashions, new models, new foreign influence, a new age, and a changed society, Thorndike 243. Although the Puritans had lost their authority in political power, they had not lost courage in abusing the stage. The most violent attack was made by Jeremy Collier, a clergyman, in 1698, in a pamphlet called A Short View of the Immorality and Profaneness of the English Stage. Collier's attack on drama has three points, the so-called obscenity of the plays, the frequent references to the Bible and biblical characters, and the criticism, slander and abuse flung from the stage upon the clergy. He criticized Shakespeare's Desdemona showing her love and chastity, he was opposed to any reference to anything connected to the church or religion, and he was against any portrayal of the clergy. Collier even accused playwrights of glorifying all the sins passions which they portrayed in their characters. The Puritan Revolution was fought not only against the king, but also against theatre, but the theatre was never so finally and roundly defeated as the king. The skirmishes and battles were equally protracted and bitter, but the growth of the Elizabethan Jacobean drama was so hardy and so dear to so many Englishmen that it never completely died. Ordinance after ordinance was passed against stage plays, but there was hardly a year in London from 1842 to 1660 when plays were not being given. The records are full of recurrent raids by the soldiers of Parliament. 
the seizure of players and their goods, the ransacking of playhouses and their forcible demolition, and the jailing of theatre people. But these very records show that the Puritans had not succeeded in destroying theatrical activity. Roberts 228, with the accession of Queen Anne in 1702, drama was again a target of criticism since Queen Anne was completely disinterested in the arts, literature, and theatre, Roberts 250. The beginning of the reign of Queen Anne in 1702 marked the final withdrawal of court interest in drama thus English theatre was no longer for the court but the property of citizens. Roberts 252. The Age of Reason valued science, logic, and rationality, denied emotionalism and wanted an ordered society. In the area of literature, authors declared their independence of patrons, and writing became a form of M. English literature part I study material drama prepared by Atayor Raman J. Duno 3335499069 Earning One's Living. Prices for theatres were higher than today, and considerably higher than under Elizabeth I. Since drama became a commercial field, there had been innovations on the theatre buildings as well as stage props and costumes of the actors. In the political turmoil of the 19th century in Europe, drama was sometimes abused. The ruling classes tended to use theatre as a propaganda instrument during the French Revolution, Roberts 350. In the 20th century, on the other hand, drama consisted of realist settings true to life. The growing popularity of the motion picture affected drama. Soon radio and television increased in popularity, which foreshadowed the possible end of live theatre, yet it did not end. Despite all the attacks and difficulties, theatre has always been alive. It has survived since the 5th century BC. In its long history, theatre has always had rivals. However it has never been defeated, on the contrary, it has accomplished glorification. Theatre is not only an important part of a particular society that is depicted in plays, it is also the most human form of art that has ever existed. The contributions of Greek theatre to drama The ancient Greeks are famous for their many contributions to the world. Among these contributions is one that has changed culture and the arts permanently. This contribution is theatre. Greek theatre is considered the beginning of theatre as we know it. Theatre began in Athens, circa 600 BC, developing out of rituals at the Dionysia. The Dionysia was a festival for followers of the cult of Dionysius, god of wine and festivities. Greek theatre really began to take shape, however, around 400 BC. The first actor was named Thespis and it is from his name that the word thespian originated. Thespis was born in Attica, in 534 BC. He began performing speeches from epic poems and stories of the day, speaking from that character's point of view. His shows were also interactive, as he often spoke with the audience. Since no theatre really existed at the time, he traveled from place to place with a handcart. He used masks, makeup, and costumes to make his monologues more realistic. Over time, theater was changed and developed by forward-thinking playwrights. One such playwright, Ischylus, introduced the concept of using a second character, so that dialogue and the interaction of the characters could be used as a plot device. Years later, another playwright, Sophocles, added another actor, steadily decreasing the importance of the chorus while increasing character interactions. Around the same time, Euripides gradually made theatre more natural and realistic, rather than the rigid, structured form of acting. The theatre itself was outdoors and known as an amphitheatre. 
It was semicircular in shape and terraced, allowing for each visitor to have perfect view. These seats were called the theatron, literally meaning the viewing area. On average, the amphitheater was able to fit 1,500 viewers and was designed to have near-perfect acoustics. There was usually a theater in each town, as theaters were also used for religious rituals and processions as well as entertainment. In the center was a circular platform called the orchestra. On the orchestra was an altar where sacrifices to Dionysus were performed. The stage itself was called the proscenio. It was situated behind the orchestra, and was M. English literature part I study material drama prepared by Atar Yor Raman J. Duno 3335499065 constructed much like stages today, although most of the acting took place in the orchestra. The back of this stage had painted backgrounds to create the settings for each scene. These buildings were most likely brightly painted, although the paint would have faded over time, Phillips. Behind the stage, machines used for the performances were kept. These machines were advanced technology for their day, and included the Eorima, the Ikiklema, and the Periactu. The Eorima was one of the more commonly used. It was a large crane used to pull actors through the air. This was most often employed to create the illusion of gods, which led to the expression, deus ex machina. The Ikiklema was a wheeled platform. This sometimes ferried dead bodies across the stage, as murders and suicides were not shown on stage. This tradition stemmed from the superstition that to kill a person on stage would be foretelling of their actual death. The periactua consisted of two pillars, one on each side of the stage, which could turn to change the background setting without need of stage hands, ancient. All of these were constructed of simple machines, such as pulleys, levers, and wheels, made from wood, rope, and metal. They were put to use in many famous plays. The plays themselves were very similar to the modern musical. They had sing and dancing, sometimes accompanied by music. The cast was comprised of many actors, called hypocrites, both professional and amateur. The main character, or protagonist, was usually played by a professional and often highly famed actor specifically chosen by the playwright, although some playwrights would portray this character themselves. Like most present musicals, there was also a chorus. The chorus provided the mood of the play by singing and dancing. Generally the lead chorus member was a professional dancer and singer, and the rest of the chorus was made up of amateurs. All the actors were men, as women were forbidden to appear on stage. The actors wore masks when portraying a woman or animal. These masks were built from wood, cloth, and clay, sometimes covered in animal or even human hair. The holes for the eyes were very small, but the opening for the mouth was large to allow the actor's voice to resonate more easily. The actors were sometimes required to wear wooden platform shoes, or cotton wool, in order to appear taller. Actors would also use optical illusions to seem taller or shorter. Vertical stripes were worn to appear taller and horizontal stripes to appear shorter. Greek plays generally fell into one of two categories, comedy or tragedy. Other than in satirical plays, these categories would never mix. The modern symbol of drama, a smiling comedic mask and a weeping tragic mask, stems from these categories. These different types of plays varied greatly especially in their topic. Comedy plays included base, vulgar humor. Comedy plays were humorous representations of peasant life and values. They encouraged tradition and criticized what they considered immorality. 
They were generally far more popular with the lower class, as they joked about topics that the upper class would have been unable to relate to. They were considered by the Greeks to be the easiest to write and perform. Costumes for comedic plays usually depended on the characters of the play. As many of these plays were about animals, so were the costumes. The actors' masks were exaggerated and grotesque, suggesting that the audience should not take them too seriously. The most notable comedic playwright was Aristophanes, and his major plays include The Frogs and Lysistrata. M. English Literature Part I Study Material Drama Prepared by Atar Yor Raman J. Duno 3335499096 Tragedy plays were not sad or depressing, but they were about more serious subjects than the comedic plays. Instead of a chaotic, meandering plot, tragic plays had a set rhythm and pattern to them. They also excluded vulgarity, tending not to offend their viewers. Tragedy plays explored the depth of human emotion and character. They were famous for their ability to cause the audience to relate to each character in a more empathetic way. They were more sophisticated and suited to the upper class than their humorous counterpart. Costumes were generally everyday clothing, if somewhat nicer and more elaborate. Notable playwrights of the genre included Sophocles, Euripides, and Aeschylus. Prometheus Bound, Oedipus the King, and Medea are prime examples of tragic plays. Satirical plays emerged as a compromise to the two categories. These plays dealt with the same topics and ideas of a tragic play, but presented them in a comical manner. The actors mocked the clichés and styles of a tragedy, and were often exaggerated in their mannerisms. These were popular with both the upper and lower classes, and were known for being very witty, a trait the Greeks admired greatly. They were generally as amusing as comedic plays, but not as rude and offensive. Cyclops, written by the poet Euripides and the Scouts by Sophocles are the only known existing satire plays, ancient. Historians know of their existence in ancient Greece from other archaeological sources. Satire plays were considered the most difficult, for both the actors and playwrights. In competitions, a playwright would often submit a satire play to prove his worth, as well as their usual comic or tragic plays. They were also much shorter than the other plays, usually only half as long as a tragedy. Greek plays were inextricably tied to the gods. Before each play, a sacrifice would be made to Dionysus, to whom theatre really owes its beginning. Apollo was also important. As the god of music and poetry, Apollo was especially honoured by actors and playwrights. Equally important to the theatre were the Muses. The Muses were the nine goddesses of the arts. Tupsichor, Utip, Calliope, Thalia, and Melpon were the most significant to the theatre. Tupsichor and Utip personified dance and music respectively, both key elements of Greek theatre. Calliope embodied epic poetry, which was usually the basis of most plays. Delia and Melpon represented the two categories of theatre, comedy and tragedy. The Greeks have given much to our modern world through theatre. Every actor, of course, owes his or her livelihood to the Greeks' innovative thinking. Many Greek plays still exist today, preserving the culture and traditions of their time. The basics of many modern machines come from the Eorima the Echiclema, and the Periact were all machines created specifically for theatre productions. The Greeks have also provided the fundamentals of theatre. We still use stages, costumes, and makeup in acting today. We still have comedy, tragedy, and satire, although often combined, in present movies, television shows, and dramatic performances.
Many theatres are modelled after Greek amphitheatres, in order to achieve their nearly flawless acoustics. No doubt exists, however, that Greek theatre has affected our society in deeper ways as well. Since the beginning of history, stories have been used to pass on values, such as integrity, bravery, and respect. Theatre continues today to bring life to these stories, forever imprinting itself into the minds and consciences of its audience. Each person can empathize with and relate to the characters, gaining insight to their own plights and personalities. Theatre also probes deep inside the heart of humanity, for the actors as well as the audience, as if through becoming another person. You learn more about M. English Literature Part I Study Material Drama Prepared by Atar Your Raman J. Duno 3335490697 Yourself Without theatre, culture as we know it could not exist. It has been changed permanently through theatre. A simple tradition of the Greeks has become a vital part of our identity as human beings. Sophocles, 496 to 406 B. C. Sophocles, the son of a wealthy arms manufacturer, was born probably in 496 BCE in the Dim Colonus near Athens. Of all the ancient playwrights, he scored the most wins in dramatic competitions and won the most important dramatic festival, the city Dionysia, an unmatched 18 times. He received an education in music, athletics, and dancing, and as a boy of 15 was chosen to lead the paean, hymn of praise, sung by the chorus of boys after the victory of Salamis. Like most of the ancient playwrights, he acted in the plays he wrote. He showed his musical skill in public, when he played the blind singer Tamiris in his drama of the same name and played the Cythera with such success that he was painted as Tamiris with the Cythera in the famous Stopoisile, Isle, painted colonnade, a prominent gathering place in ancient Athens. Sophocles was also involved in Athenian political and military affairs. Owing to his practical gifts with language he was involved in negotiations with the allies of Chios and Samos. During the Peloponnesian War he was one of the generals. In 435 BC, fulfilling the office of Hellenotamias, he was at the head of the management of the treasure of the Allies, which was kept on the Acropolis, and in 413 BC, when the question arose of giving to the state an oligarchical constitution, he was on the commission of preliminary investigation. He also filled a priestly office. The charm and the refinement of his character seemed to have won him many friends. Among them was the historian Herodotus. He was also deemed by antiquity as a man especially beloved by the gods, particularly by Asclepius, god of medicine, whose priest he probably was, and who was said to have granted him health and vigor of mind to extreme old age. By the Athenian Nicostrate he had a son, Iophon, who won some repute as a tragic poet, and by Theris of Sicyon another son, Ariston, father of another Sophocles who gained fame for himself by writing tragedies of his own, and afterwards by the production of his grandfather's dramas. There was a legend that a quarrel arose between Sophocles and his son Iophon, on account of his preference for this grandson, and that, when summoned by I often before the court as weak in mind and unable to manage his affairs, he obtained his own absolute acquittal by reading the chorus on his native place in the Oedipus Curnews. The tales of his death, in 405 BC, are also mythical. According to one account, he was choked by a grape. According to others, he died either when publicly reciting the Antigone, or from excessive joy at some dramatic victory. The only fact unanimously attested by his contemporaries is that his death was as dignified as his life. We are also told that the god Dionysius, 
by repeated apparitions in dreams, prompted the general of the Spartans, who were then attacking Athens, to grant a truce in order to bury the poet in the family grave outside the city. On his tomb stood a siren as a symbol of the charm of poetry. After his death the Athenians worshipped him as a hero and offered an annual sacrifice in his memory. In later times, on the proposal of the orator Lycagus, a bronze statue was erected to him, together with Ischylus and Euripides, in the theatre, and an authorized and standard copy of his dramas was made to preserve them. M. Dotter English Literature Part I Study Material Drama Prepared by Atar Yor Raman J. Duno 3335499068 Even in his lifetime, and indeed through the whole of antiquity, he was held to be the most perfect of tragedians, one of the ancient writers calls him the pupil of Homer. If Ischylus is the creator of Greek tragedy, it was Sophocles who brought it to perfection. He extended the dramatic action, one, by the introduction of a third actor, so that three people could be on stage in addition to the chorus, while in his last pieces he even added a fourth, and, two, by a due subordination of the chorus, to which, however, he gave a more artistic development, while he increased its numbers from 12 to 15 persons. These moves made dialogue all the more important. He also perfected the costumes and decoration. But Sophocles' great mastery of his art appears, above all, in the clearness with which he portrays his characters, which are developed with a scrupulous attention to details, and in which he is not satisfied, like his Shilas, with mere outlines, nor, as Euripides often did, with copies from common life. His heroes, too, are ideal figures, like those of Ischylus. While they lack the superhuman loftiness of Ischylus' creations, they have a certain ideal truth of their own. In contrast to Euripides, Sophocles, like Ischylus, is profoundly religious, and the attitude which he adopts towards popular religion is marked by an instinctive reverence. The grace peculiar to Sophocles' nature makes itself felt in his language, the charm of which was universally praised by the ancients. With his noble simplicity he takes in this respect also a middle place between the weightiness and boldness of the language of Ischylus, and the smoothness and rhetorical embellishment which distinguish that of Euripides. Sophocles was a very prolific poet. The number of his plays is given as between 123 and 130, of which above 100 are known to us by their titles and by fragments. Only seven have been preserved complete, the Trachinus, so named from the chorus, and its treating of the death of Heracles, the Ajax, the Philoctetes, the Electra, the Oedipus Tyrannus, the Oedipus at Colonus, and the Antigon. The last mentioned play was produced in the spring of 440 BC, the Philoctetes in 410 BC. The Oedipus at Colonus was not put on the stage until 401 BC, after his death, by his grandson Sophocles. Besides tragedies, Sophocles composed paeans, elegies, epigrams, and a work in prose on the chorus. The Greek theatre, evolution and influence without a doubt, the Greek theatre remains one of the most recognized and distinctive buildings in the world. While we associate many features of modern theatres with their Greek counterparts, the ancient theatre was a very different animal. The size, shape, and functions of the various pieces, though analogous to the modern theatre, were quite different in ancient times. The Greek theatre evolved to fit the changing specifications of tragedy, eventually into the form that survives at hundreds of sites around the Mediterranean. At the same time, the overarching simplicity of the Greek theatre, despite the many changes, demanded certain features of the tragedies. 
as tragedy evolved from choral songs to works such as Oedipus the King, a unique, reciprocal relationship developed with the theatre. The earliest Greek theatres recall tragedy's origins in choral songs sung to local heroes and divinities. Choral songs were an early Greek performative art, in which a large group of people, the chorus, in Greek, literally equals dance, would dance and sing raucous songs in honor of a god. Choral performances in honor of the god Dionysus evolved into what we know as tragedy, an enduring art form that the Greeks invented in the 6th M. English literature part I study material drama prepared by Atar Yor Raman J. Duno 3335499069 CBC. These performances took place in a large, circular orchestra, or dancing area, in which the chorus performed. The orchestra was simply a flattened patch of earth, unpaved, and delimited by a rim of large stones. At the center of the orchestra, stood an altar to Dionysius, the patron god of tragedy. The chorus did not use the altar per se during performance, instead, the altar acted as a focal point around which the chorus danced and sang. A simple, undecorated wooden tent, or scheme stood behind the orchestra and provided a place for the chorus to store instruments or other props needed during the dance. Audiences began to attend these performances, and orchestras started to be built against hillsides. The rising earth formed a natural seating area, a theater, in Greek equals watching place, from which spectators could view the performances. These choral songs evolved into tragedy with the addition of actors. The actors, naturally, needed some way to physically separate themselves from the chorus and the orchestra. The small tent gave way to larger wooden buildings. These new and improved scheme provided a degree of separation for the actors, as well as doors through which the actors could enter and exit. These wooden platforms, though still temporary, were painted with architectural features, though our word scene comes from the Greek scheme, these paintings were purely decorative and in no way influenced the tragedy or its content. During this time, other areas of the theatre became more defined. First, the orchestra was sunk just below the level of the audience, thus formalizing the stone rim. The orchestra was also paved with large, flat stones. Second, rows of wooden seats were built on the hillside. These benches wrapped more than halfway around the orchestra and began the Greek theatre's distinctive architectural form. Over time, the actors supplanted the chorus as the dominant characters in tragedy, and theatre design reflected this important shift. The scheme evolved again, this time into a complex and permanent stone structure. This generation of skein allowed the actors to perform on stage level as well on the roof. The building became large and sturdy to accommodate the various machines that became popular in tragic performances. Such skein were also higher and elaborately decorated with sculpture and architectural features. The new tragic pattern also had ramifications for the orchestra. As the prominence of the chorus diminished, the orchestra got smaller and smaller. Late Greek and Roman theatres often reduced the orchestra to a semicircle. Further modifications came to the audience. Stone seating replaced the wooden benches, and large walkways partitioned the seats for easy access. Even in its later form, the Greek theatre remained starkly simple, and this heavily influenced the tragedy's performance. First, the Greek theatres were much larger than their modern counterparts, and some theatres held over 14,000 spectators. On these grand scales, actors' tools for communication with the audience were entirely different than modern ones. Body language, facial gestures, and vocal tones, though very effective in a small, modern theatre, would have been lost in the sheer size of an ancient one. 
Instead, the actor wore a huge tragic mask to roughly depict his state of mind and relied on his speech to do the rest. Lengthy monologues were the only means available for character development. These passages contrast with modern drama, but in ancient times were entirely necessary. Second, the theater provided no special effects, save a crane in the scheme capable of raising and lowering characters onto the stage. Lighting, background changes, curtains, and sounds, the staple special effects in modern dramatic performance, were unavailable to the Greeks. Instead, all special effects had to be done through the script. Murder, sex, natural disasters, suicide, and battles all took M. English literature part I study material drama prepared by Atar Yor Raman J. Duno 3335499069 place off stage, messengers then reported the results. Given the practical constraints, this was the only sensible way of doing business. Modern readers often desire to see these important actions, as they are often the critical points in the tragedy. They take place off stage not because of incompetence, but because of the limitations of the theater. Greek tragedy and the Greek theater influenced each other in such a way that the discussion of one necessarily involves the other. As Greek tragedy developed from hymns of praise to local gods to the complex works of Ischylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, the theatre adapted accordingly. All the while, the theatre remained an essentially simple building and affected the way the tragic poets developed their works. In the end, the distinctive features of Greek tragedy and the Greek theatre resulted from the interaction between the two.